Public Safety Committee. I'm Jack Weiss. I'm joined by Ed Reyes and Greg Smith. Colleagues, um, a couple of items that can go on consent. You consent. Item two. Item four. Item six. And item seven through ten. We have a question on item four. Okay, so item four we will hold on to. Uh, Mr. Smith. All right. Okay. So we'll move those items forward. We'll hold Mr. White. will hold number four. Um, okay. Uh, item one, please, Mr. White. Item one, police department to present verbal report relative to the status of DNA testing, backlog, and cold hits. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yvette Sanchez Owens, LAPD, Scientific Investigation Division. Uh, we have a total backlog of 7,799 assault kits in our uh, property room. And that is composed of um, 7,281 that are rape kits that have never been requested for analysis. And then 211 of those are rape kits that have been requested for analysis but have not yet been completed. 307 of those are other kits that have been requested but not completed. So other means? Uh, it could be associated with a homicide oh, or okay. property okay. crime. So far this year, we have had 654 new kits booked into property. Of that number, 423 have not yet been requested for analysis. To date, we have had um, 186 case to offender notifications in our cold hit program. And so far this year, we've had 14 case-to-case -case hit notifications. Eight of them were rape sex kits uh, cases. Three of them were burglaries. One was a homicide and two were robberies. Thank you, Ms. Sanchez. Mm -hmm. Good morning, Lieutenant. Good morning, Lieutenant Morris, Robbie Homicide Division, Cold Case Special Section. Um, overall, uh, we have a decrease in every area of our hits this year versus last year. So for the totals, uh, this year we have 180 versus 223 the same time last year for a 19 percent decrease our homicide hits 23 versus 24 last year 4 percent decrease and cold case homicide is, is handling 17 percent of those sexual assault hits 101 versus 115 for a 12 percent decrease cold case is handling 49 percent of those Rape special is handling 13%, and the divisions are handling approximately 39% of those hits. All other hits, 56 versus 84 for the same time last year for a 33% decrease. 25 are burglary, 28 robbery, and three others. And of the 180 um, hits year to date, RHD personnel are handling 66 or 37% of those. Thank you. Just ask one very quick question of. of, of both of you, maybe you know the maybe there really is no answer. Um, I remember at the beginning of the year uh, when you were giving these reports, um, it started, you know, early on, the beginning of the year. Uh, some of those hits were down, and I thought, well, she's saying that now, but I'm sure by the end of the year it'll catch up. Um, and I was always hoping that that would happen. Uh, and I'm, I'm just curious if you have any theories as to why the hits are down. And one possible explanation is just that it is, it's a statistical anomaly, or that it's not, that you can't really slice and dice these stats from year to year. On the other, maybe there are some more, you know, more sound explanations. Do, do you know of any? Do you have of any? I don't know of any sound explanation other than um, just based on my own experience with a lot of these hits, many of these people are in custody already. And so once you've gotten those hits, you just, we haven't found um, any other um, people out there, no one has hit on them. And that's the only thing I can think of is that they're not, in other words, we're not getting more hits because some of these folks who are recidivists are in custody. So there are not other crimes that they're out there committing that's going to generate more hits. 
That's, that's one, one explanation that I can have just from looking at a lot of the hits that we get and we go out and we get the confirmation samples, the folks well, are already in custody. And if, and if we don't know, we don't know. Ms. Sanchez, owns you have any? I, I think there's also another possible explanation and that is that we were collecting uh, under Prop 69 um, all felony, convicted felons, um, DNA samples. Um, that has pretty much maxed out. Um, I suspect we're so going to we see sort of a Prop 69 bubble or bump, and I then we're sort so. of returning more to a post Prop 69 normal. Right. Is that I think I think most of those are in the system now, um, so you're hitting on the same database. But I think we're going to see another bubble on that um, starting next year when we start um, entering all felony arrests. Okay. That really makes sense. Uh, Mr. Smith or Mr. Reyes, do you have any questions on the DNA report today? Well, thank you very much for coming. Thanks for the report. We, we appreciate it and keep doing what we can to help you guys get the resources you need. Thank, thank you. you very much. Next item, please, Mr. White. Item three, CAO and Board of Police Commissioners reports relative to police permit and special service fees. Morning. Good morning. Uh, Wilson Poon from the CAO's office. Richard T. Fank, Executive Director of the Police Commission. And Rene Gomez, Police Commission staff. Um, item three is our uh, police permit fee report. And um, I'll briefly walk you through what we did in this report. Um, we pretty much calculated these uh, permit costs by looking at the amount of time it's they spent, um, Police Commission, and uh, Office of Finance spent um, processing these permits, multiplied that times the hourly rate, their salaries, and that was the administrative portion of the cost. We also try to capture the enforcement costs, and these are in the uh, renewal fee. And um, we took the annual salaries of all the um, sworn officers in the enforcement unit, and we costed that over the 8,000 permits that are issued. And that's how we get the uh, $80, which is part of the uh, $100 of the renewal fee. Um, Attachment one, you'll find um, what the current fee is and what we're proposing. Um, you'll see some very significant increases, mostly in the massage business, the massage therapist, the bath tanning salon, and the reflexologist fees. And um, a big reason why those have um, increased so significantly is because we've included the county examination and the county. Uh, What's a reflexologist? Um, I, it's uh, someone who uh, examines like the feet and massages them. And, right. And the police department regulates. Them. Yes, sir. We do under the ordinances. <laughs> it's just I don't know. Always wondered about this stuff. Does it? Okay. So um, right. yeah. so we've built in the county costs, um, which are 151 per test and 262 per uh, health examination. Um, the re renewal fees have mostly been consistent at $100 um, with some slight, um, like there's increases in massage therapists. Um, and also I did want to note that for the towing operation and the tow towing unit operator, um, there, there needs to be a slight correction. Um, the renewal fee should stay the same as 76 and 32 as the current, as the current fee is. Um, in the 09010, I guess, um, the next permit fee report will update those numbers. We just don't have any prior year numbers, statistics to base um, the cost out the, the new renewal fee because it's, uh, it just went into effect January 1st, 07. So, um, in terms of revenue, um, we estimated that the implementation of these new fees would generate a, about 2.28 million more than the amount of revenue received in 06, 07. Uh, most of this is, of course, the false alarm fees. Um, we're looking at 1.66 million increase from what we received in 06, 07. Um, we're also expecting about 4.71, I mean, I'm sorry, 428,000 more in the uh, total permit fees. Um, and that's about it. Ms. Stengel has told me that there is an issue regarding the, uh, if it's the effective date or the need to have the <coughs> ordinance enacted so that you can collect these fees and get the fees in the, in the kitty for the coming year. What, what, what is that issue with regards to the timing, Mr. T. Fank, and how can we 
uh, make sure that there are no problems? Uh, yes, sir. The, uh, the issue is the, the bills will be generated by the Office of Finance in the first week of October uh, from new information we received this morning from the Office of Finance. They're going to be using general services uh, this year to print the bills, which is about $37,000. So if they are going to go out the first week of October and the committee and ultimately the council makes the adjustment in the fees, those have to be in place at the time that they generate the billing so that we can have the collection of those that would, for those uh, permits that are renewed effective January 1 of 2009. So that's the timing piece. Now whether it has to be, the ordinance has to actually be in effect on the date that the bills are mailed or be in effect on January 1 of 2009, that's an issue for the city attorney to opine on, I don't know. But we do have a timing issue of getting these out so we don't have a loss of the revenue. When, when it comes to drafting <clears throat> the, I guess so in other words, there's an ordinance it's not here before us? That's correct. You would direct the city attorney, if you approve the fees, direct the city attorney to prepare an ordinance that would list these as the fees. And, and, and with respect to that ordinance, other than crossing out numbers and filling in new numbers, is there any other work that needs to be done in terms of modifying that ordinance? Or is it really just replacing one set of numbers with another set of numbers? Replacing numbers. Um, so I asked the city attorney. Um, can, can we, do you think we can have that um, prepared and, and I'd just wave it from this committee and we get it to council right away just so that no one can ever argue that there was something inappropriate with them being billed at the higher amount? Is that something that could be done pretty quickly? Yes, that's something we could definitely do very quickly. Um, I believe Ms. Stengel told me that it's also scheduled for budget and finance, so we need to ask that committee if they would waive it. But I agree with you um, that if we could get it to council as soon as possible to get it considered by the full council, that'd be great. So how long do you think it'll take? Oh, we can draft it in probably a day. Day, good. Okay. Good. Plugging in the numbers, that's... Mr. White? Thank you. Um, I'll work with the city attorney, but I believe the ordinance may have a public hearing requirement, which could delay its scheduling by council by up to 10 days or more. The California government code requires a notice of hearing of up to 10 days of any fee increase. If that's the case, with the last week of council being in recess in September, that may uh, cause some scheduling conflict. Okay, well, I guess you'll look into that and you'll do whatever needs to be done under California law. Um, if the city attorney could please prepare that ordinance with the new numbers that we're going to approve in committee today, and then you and Mr. White will determine if it goes to Mr. Parks's committee or if it just goes, this item today will go to Mr. Parks's committee. I ass no, or this, yes. I mean, so, so somehow or other, Mr. Parks's committee have the chance to weigh in on the numbers, but let's try to get this ordinance ready to go and get it, no does it, does it need a committee hearing or a hearing in council is sufficient? You're just saying there's a statutory number of days prior to the hearing. It refers to the council consideration of the ordinance. Okay. Well, if you can, if the if city service can prepare the ordinance today, that would be great. And we'll get, we're going to move okay. things along. Mr. Reyes or Mr. Smith, do you have any questions on the item? Mr. Smith. I've got does. some, Mr. Oh, Mr. Zion is here as well. Mr. Smith, did you have a question? Yeah, just uh, on the proposed kind of flat fee for renewals, from what I gather from the report is there's only a couple categories that are really causing a problem that you're just kind of spreading it out. You, you don't really have uh, issues on these renewals on most of these categories. So you're just kind of flat feeing it because you don't want to do a lot of work on things you never have problems with. What, are there just a couple of these that really are a lot of work? I would presume dance clubs would be a lot of work. Um, uh, I don't know if it's firearms maybe. Uh, massage businesses certainly are. It, would it be better to signal them out and go ahead and have a larger fee for those couple and then spread it to a smaller amount for everybody else? and let them pay the burden because they're the ones creating the burden? burden? On the, the massage parlors, the way that process works, uh, all the massage therapists, the, the renewal is just like basically the first application. 
you have to ensure that individual is not having a rest record, et cetera, since the time the first one was issued. So th that's why the massage therapists and all the massage related ones are a little bit higher. As to the sp specifics of all the renewals, what we did from, from our staff side at the police commission, I'll let the CEO re respond to what they did. We looked again at the actual time it took to process it. So you'll see the CAO has made some adjustments in our recommended numbers to come up with $100 generally. So I would have them respond to that. As far as the basics and, and why we looked at each one of them differently, uh, Renee Gomez, who did that actual work, could respond to any specific individual permit renewal that we, we looked at. But they basically were looking at the individuals who processed that permit, their hourly salary, salary rate, the, the cap rate, and including that to come up with a full cost recovery for that processing of that permit. So that's the methodology we used. But it, you know, the methodology you used was you took the gross cost of doing all renewals mm -hmm. and then divided it pretty much equally, even though there's only a couple of categories that really require a lot more work. Mm -hmm. And so I'm saying, why not make them really pay? Because they're the ones creating most of the mm -hmm. work, and then and flat fee everybody else at eighty dollars instead of a hundred, mm -hmm. because that's more reflective of the cost to them and us to give them their renewals. And we're not raising their amounts a lot, but just focus on the two or three categories that really drive the cost up. Mm -hmm. Well, in this case, it does reflect. Uh, for most of these, it's simply um, for a renewal. A person fills out the bill. They send it to the office of finance. The office of finance opens the bill, uh, you know, updates the, their status in the computer. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we felt the best way was just to spread out all the enforcement costs over and, all the permits. And I, don't, I don't argue that point. What I'm saying mm -hmm. is for, uh, say there's 100 categories here, for 90 of them, why mm -hmm. don't you do that? Mm -hmm. But for those handful, I, I'm only looking at four, that really causes the department some time because you don't just off, you don't automatically just approve uh, firearms, mm -hmm. um, dance halls, and massage parlors. You mm -hmm. have to go back and check the criminal record to see if there's been any complaints, mm -hmm. etc. As opposed to the secondhand bookstore. Yeah. So yeah. go ahead and do a desktop approval of all those others for 80 bucks or 90 mm -hmm. bucks, whatever. But those four or five categories, it really takes some time because you don't just do a, mm -hmm. a desktop review. Um, make them pay what it's really costing us. Mm -hmm. And I think it would right. be fairer to everybody then. Right. I mean, from our perspective, the, the renewal cost, like you said, you're correct, absolutely correct. $80 of that $100 is for enforcement for all 8,000 permits. Mm -hmm. The other $20 is for that clerk typist who opens up the renewal letter and processes it. Um, if you were to distribute those enforcement costs per um, business, you would see a larger number for certain businesses. Yeah, which is what we have now. Is what you're, what you're asking. Yeah. And unfortunately, it would just be very difficult to track um, how many times we and you see huge, I don't think the police commission does that. Um, yeah, we wouldn't have a way of tracking, you know, how much time CID goes out and, uh, you know, investigates uh, a therapist because the number is actually, you know, could be very small. I mean, maybe we could ask the head of CID, but I mean, how many uh, people do we investigate, say, for a prostitution arrest, someone who currently has a massage therapist license? I mean, that might be like 50 people. And if we would have to spread out CID's enforcement costs over those 50 people, all the massage therapists who are legitimate and never uh, have any problems would end up, they would subsidize, you know, that the enforcement costs. So this spreads it out over a greater number of permits, lowering, you know, the overall cost. But as you say, yeah, there are some permits that we don't have a whole lot of enforcement activity and, you know, they're going to bear some of that, the $70. But, you know, I think that it's probably a better alternative than simply just to say have massage therapists and say nightclubs, which are another enforcement activity area, you know, bear the whole cost. I mean, you might end up having, you know, $500 for renewal. The renewal permit would be more than the, app, the initial permit, uh, uh, you know, application, so. Oh, well, this is the cost of doing business. If you're doing a business, it causes us problems. I'm not, I'm not going to bleed sure, sure. for them. You know, I don't really yeah. care. Uh, but I do care about the other business that we don't want to spend any time enforcing on, that we never go into right. and never spend any time on. Sure. It's the cost of the clerk opening it up and improving it, and that's it. Mm -hmm. So why have them carry some of the burden, mm -hmm. which is probably 90% of the, the, the people here, 
why have them carry some of the burden for the enforcement of those businesses that we have to enforce that do cause problems? Why not say 90% of you get a lower fee because we don't spend mm -hmm. any time doing it? Sure. And those four or five business categories, mm -hmm. we're going to charge you what it costs us to maintain mm -hmm. uh, control over you because you're a problem for us. Mm -hmm. That's why we do this. That's why the fees are higher in the first place. And that's sure. why their renewal fees used to be $300. Mm -hmm. And now you're dropping them $200 each for being mm -hmm. what? Good citizens? I, mm -hmm. I don't get it. They're not good citizens. That's why we have enforcement problems mm -hmm. there. Mr. Gray? You're right. In terms of, um, I don't think we need to track. We already have enough trends, don't we? I mean, don't we have a significant knowledge as to how these different businesses and entities behave, where it's not an issue of having to track and add more administrative functions and more labor and more time. Don't we have enough of an understanding of, of what these businesses do or, or don't do and, and go on that? I mean, they're going to follow the premise of Councilmember Smith? Uh, yeah. I, I, I will tell you that when, we, when the report was prepared, our reports were prepared in June of 2007 and August of 2007. When we prepared the reports at that time, uh, quite frankly, there was no system in place to track the individual permits and the amount of time that we spent on individual cases, such as a massage therapist that create a problem. One particular business might take 20 hours of your time and the rest of them not take any time. We were not tracking it, breaking it out in that manner. We do have that process in place now. But again, when you look at the numbers of people that we have in these variety of businesses, uh, we might have one uh, massage business that we believe is operating a prostitution ring. We'll do our focus of enforcement, et cetera. And at the end of the day, we might spend 20, 25 hours on that and find that there's no evidence that prostitution took place. Is it fair then to charge that individual with that additional money? So it becomes difficult to do what, what you're suggesting, sir, which I understand what you're suggesting, in that make those who are the violators pay and those who are not the violators not pay. Uh, that becomes difficult to try to separate aid out and, and track that information. I think to your, your first premise, uh, Councilmember Smith, that if you wanted to, to lower the 100 to 90 or 80, that's, that's the committee's prerogative. You all can do that. But we are now tracking, uh, but I would just suggest that the, the difficulty in then spreading out that through that entire class, you can't be punitive to one individual uh, in that class and then give everybody else a break in that class. It becomes difficult, I think, to create that type of, an, of a permit scheme. The way we have it now, it's sort of like insurance. Everyone's got to pay 70 bucks, you know, hoping that no one else is going to, you know, uh, violate the law or something. The other difficulty would be if, let's say one year for some reason, key duplicators, you know, there's a ring of key duplicator crimes, you know, suddenly those are the people that you would want to charge you know additional money and that could change although generally speaking the enforcement problems are in uh the parking lots massage parlors nightclubs dance halls those generally have the most activity but let's say you know two years from now there's a spike in key duplicators or another thing you know for that year would you then want to increase all the key duplicators uh you know, cost to pay for that enforcement that happened during that particular year. This way kind of just evens it out among everybody, kind of like insurance. It's a different philosophy. I mean, it doesn't, uh, you know, it's not directly to, you know, who comes up with the cost, but that's just the way we thought it'd be fairest for the most amount of people. Maybe. Um, some of these fees are going down. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What's the logic behind that? Uh, the logic behind that is in 1986 when the fees were last uh, adjusted, uh, we have no institutional memory of how those fees came about. No one is in existence. I cannot validate the fee. Uh, I have no idea how that fee came about. What we looked at is today's process and methodology. So uh, I would just say to you that uh, I don't know why those fees were established in 1986 as they were. If I was here then, I could probably respond to that. So <laughs> the way it is today when we're looking at, for example, <coughs> escort, Number 25, the current fee is $59, is going to 424 That's correct. So we assess that under the current value. That's correct, sir. But for the reports, the 77,000 plus arrest, crime, and traffic reports, we're charging 23, we're going to continue to charge 23. Yes, sir. It says there's no additional cost to 
generate and produce those reports for the public? What, what has occurred is, again, the volume has gone up, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the, the staff time and the processing time has gone down. So that, that balances out with, with the increase in salaries over the years. The processing time it takes to process those reports has gone down. And I had a, a opportunity to visit communications <coughs> last week. And I was speaking to one of the senior dispatchers uh, regarding the <coughs> alarms, the false yes, alarms. Mm -hmm. And she informed me that we have no way of documenting the repeat alarm calls. That's correct. Under the current uh, inadequate system, we do not. When we are able to ultimately get uh, our Cry Wolf system installed, that will all interface and they will have direct accessibility to that information. So Under someone who gets repeated calls, there's no way of giving them, we talk about a bill, there's no way they're going to get a bill because we can't track it. They'll, the they'll get a, they'll, they will get a bill on our end, but as far as the, uh, the PSR looking at information he or she has in front of them, well, no, no. they don't have that information, sir. And again, it's because of this uh, and antique that we have as a system and the transition now we're moving into cry wolf which unfortunately for full implement implementation is about nine months away and we just had our first kickoff meeting last week so we're operating with early 1990s technology that was built as a tracking system and now we're trying to convert it into a billing system and it's just inefficient and so we're trying to fix that <clears throat> excuse me so the purpose of cry wolf is to do tracking and to billing and monitoring Right, all at the same. All at the same time, yes, sir. And that would help with these numbers. That Absolutely. <clears throat> the other question I remember when the second-hand dealers uh, had an issue when a couple of years ago they tried to raise their fees. Um, second-hand dealers, the uh, pawn shops. And looking at this, it looks like their costs are going up <coughs> moderate increase. Yes, sir. There, there was uh, the last attempt to do this. There was an inordinate increase uh, to some of the the vendors in that particular area, a pawn shop versus a secondhand dealer, and the methodology and the process we came up with this trip, I think, is a lot fairer and equitable to them. I mean, it, it was a dramatic increase. Yes, it was. You're correct, sir. We campaigned against that, and somehow that's we correct, kept sir. it down. Right. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have. <clears throat> the past few years, we've had these uh, dispensaries of of uh, medical marijuana, mm -hmm. do they also have to pay fees? Are there fees associated with that? They don't have a police permit because we currently do not regulate them under a police permit. So they do not have a police permit. They might have some other business permit. I'm sure they have that. I don't know what other permits they get in the city, but they are not regulated by a police permit. Thank you. There's currently a moratorium on that, and we're working that out with the city attorney, right. police planning, building safety, to come up with the regulation and eventually be included in that. That's still in the works. Yeah, I, know. <laughs> yeah, I just had one question because I'm looking in the file. I don't see it, but we we see the permit fees jumps from 4.71 to 5.1 million. What do the renewal fees jump to, or does that remain static? Okay, do you have that? The renewal increase with the adjustments, to, uh, Wilson or Renee? Do you have that number? It's not in the report that I could see. I believe we'll, we have it in our original report, but it does not take into consideration the adjustments that were made by the, the CAO. I, give me just one moment, I'll be able to tell you that. In our original report, uh, before the adjustments made by the CAO, we uh, anticipated a $211,000 increase in renewal revenue. Uh, that was based on that number of renewals at that snapshot that we had. That was 211,000. I do not know what the adjustments that have been made. Would you presume that under the new system you're putting in, that in a future year we could go back and take a look at this flat fee and see if we need to be charging some categories, maybe have a, a double system, either A or a B. If you're A category, we don't do anything. It's going to be this versus a B category would be that. And then the constant, the constant amount will remain the same. Right. What we're doing now, um, <clears throat> excuse me, as you know, the fees have not been uh, increased since 1986. Uh, Mr. Gomez has a responsibility of an annual review. So we're in the process of doing that work now for next year. What we will do is we'll take the numbers that come into play in January of 2009 as to the renewals will go out, evaluate that. So the report that would come forward in early 2009 for the 0908 adjustments would have that information you're asking yeah, about. Because yeah, I'm really reluctant to approve this today. I will just because it's where we're at at the moment. But 
for the future years, I want to see this renewal issue take another look at it because I don't think this is fair. It's really not fair for most of the people. We'll respond to your concern. Okay. Well, we will approve the item and appreciate the city attorneys moving uh, quickly on the companion ordinance. Thank you for the presentation. Next Thank item, you. please, Mr. White. Item four, fire department report relative to increasing fees for emergency ambulance service. Mr. Reyes, why don't we, um, why don't we let you begin with your question since you call the item special. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chair. Um, we know we're all going through uh, economic hardships and there's been a whole series of fee increases that have been occurring throughout all the city services and throughout the county. Have we looked at what this particular fee would mean in the context of all these fee increases given the, uh, the level of activity that occurs in different geographic areas in the city that are more concentrated levels of, of use of these facilities, these needs? Did we look at that at all? Was that ever in your thought process as you went through this uh, proposal? Uh, Mary Ann Rivera from the Fire Department. Uh, what we do is we take the full cost and then we, we divide it up by the number of transports and we don't really have the specific information that you're speaking of. So it wasn't factored in the levels of, of uh, fee increases that are occurring simultaneously uh, given what we're going through now and the impact on what we'll have on the public, especially those who are essentially struggling uh, just to get by. We do take into consideration the county's increase and we use that as a factor in, in our adjustments. As the, the county increased their fees, so we also increased ours, but we do go based on our full cost. So that's the extent that um, That's as far as you went in terms of dealing with the very uh, low income population. We are obligated, Salvador Martinez, also fire department, we are obligated to go for full cost recovery per the directions of the mayor. But we, uh, we are consistently looking at our fees to ensure that not only the city's costs are covered, but it's consistent with what's applied throughout the county as well. So although our fees are adjusted on an annual basis, it's consistent with other other agencies in the region are also charging. So there's that, that aspect that we are ensuring that we're not overcharging while at the same time ensuring that we are covering our cost. I see. The 53 million that comes out uh, at, at the new report, you state there's about 53 million that will be generated? Yes, 56.3 million. 56.3. Um, that gets us to cost recovery? Well, it's, it's uh, we are working on getting full cost recovery. It's a step toward that, yes. Councilman. Uh, there are other uh, restrictions we have. Certain costs are, are not fully reimbursement. Medi-Cal, Medicare, they only give us a portion of, the, uh, of that cost, and that's you know, restricted by their, their uh, regulations. Well, uh, this is going to sound a little bizarre, but I, I'm aware of cases and I've heard of folks who don't call for fire department or ambulance uh, support because of the cost. Are we doing anything to discourage that? I mean, is there any way to, to um, reinforce the fact that folks should be using these services? I mean, in the very low income areas, you know, you do hear of folks saying, I'm not going to call the ambulance and they make the poor patients suffer, they take them any way they can to the hospital, but they don't want to pay those extra fees. Is there anything that we're doing to address that dynamic? We do have a low income program and if they meet the, uh, the requirements, then they are exempt from paying those fees. So they are exempt? If they meet the, uh, the criteria, yes. Now how do they become aware of that particular aspect? I mean, folks aren't aware of that. Our, when when, uh, when services provided, though, a councilman, our our, uh, our officers are sworn, are primarily concerned about the health of those uh, individuals. So their first and foremost uh, 
the directive is to, to take care of the medical needs of those injured or, uh, or ill and uh, transport them to the nearest available medical right. facility. And I appreciate what you're saying, but that's when they are called and when they get there and they have that interaction. I'm speaking about that period be, when the decision is being made, do we call or don't we call? And if they were aware of these exemptions, they might call. They might have the incentive to call or, or at least not be hesitant uh, to call. Do you hear what I'm saying? Yes, I understand what you're saying. And, and, and that period of time, I mean, are we doing anything to inform the public of those exemptions so that you don't have young children or, or seniors suffering unnecessarily because whoever's making the decision feels they can't pay? You, that's usually handled after the uh, service is provided and it's delivered. And then when the bill comes up, they are made aware after that, mm -hmm. after the service is provided. But the intent is we don't discourage it. We will pro provide transport to all that are in need. And then, and that's the primary uh, focus of the uh, providing the services, to make sure that the medical needs are met and they're transported to the nearest facilities. The, the actual cost and billing is, is reviewed after that factor. Yeah. And when uh, they do apply and uh, are made aware of that, uh, they are not charged if they qualify right. for that service or no. that program. No, I, I hear you. I mean, I hear what you're saying. But what I'm realizing is that this city is not proactive in informing the public that these exemptions exist. That we don't have a way of informing people that that particular exemption actually exists. I, I mean, you would know once you go through the process you just described. I'm trying to get to that awareness, that level of understanding of the public that they should not hesitate to call for health services if there is an accident or something occurring to a family member and they should call because it's needed and the dollar issue shouldn't be a factor because there are these exemptions if they qualify, correct? Correct. So we don't have anything out there that informs people of that. Uh that's correct, but at the same time, we are also transporting people, regardless of the cost. If the need's there, they call, we will respond, and we will transport them. Right. I, I, I'm, I'm, I know what that, I think I know what I need to do. I need, we need to start looking at how we get people informed. And so that way they can actually understand that they have that opportunity. So when they get to that phase you're talking about, that you go through that process. Good morning. Uh, David Yamahata, Assistant Chief, Chief of Staff for the Fire Department. Uh, I understand your concerns, Councilman Reyes. So what we can do is develop kind of a public education component, uh, put it on our LAFD website. Uh, I think in conjunction with that, uh, we want to also uh, put some information regarding kind of uh, uh, abuse of the 911 system in conjunction with that. So we kind of educate both sides. Great. Well, can we get a report back? Sure, we can, we can do that. We to, can work with your office, put together kind of a draft in terms of information, uh, make sure that it covers all the concerns that you have, you know, and then we can come back to the committee and report on that. And in a diverse city as, as we are, uh, and you do have these in, uh, different socioeconomic dynamics and densities throughout the city, and the awareness of what public service means and the availability of support uh, really is ranges throughout the spectrum for all the different reasons we know, language, culture, etc. Uh, but I would like to see a report back and see how we can improve upon that and, uh, and really design this so that people who need it can actually use it and, be, and hopefully folks won't abuse the system. Definitely. What, uh, as was indicated earlier, what we don't want to do is discourage somebody that <coughs> needs help from calling 911. I believe you, I'm aware of folks where I hear those conversations and I find it's, 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 it's rather shocking, but it occurs. But thank you very much. The uh, cost recovery you mentioned, the county versus the city, the county doesn't transport. That's all private contract to transport. So when we compare the cost of L.A. City Fire Ambulance Service to the county, are we including the transport or are we excluding the transport? 
because you're talking one thousand dollars I understand mr. Ray is concerned a thousand four dollars the proposed rate seven hundred twelve dollars for BLS fee I mean that's a lot of money to an individual does that include when they're comparing are we comparing to the county that doesn't transport they send the paramedics they treat if it's going to be transported it's sent to a private ambulance they do their separate billing so are we comparing the same or are we comparing different numbers we're comparing their increase as well as their ratio for ALS and BLS well no my question is the county doesn't transport and we do you said you just surveyed the county the county numbers are they going to charge a thousand dollars a thousand four dollars for the county to transport and then another fee on top of that in other words the county paramedic arrives that's a thousand dollars and then they transport that's another seven hundred dollars are people transported in the county of LA by county paying more than they would pay in the city are we comparing the same or are we comparing something different the county rates are slightly lower and they would not be charged the thousand and the seven hundred what is the county rate 982. it would be 982 for ALS and seven hundred dollars for BLS and what about the transport how much is that that is the transport well they don't transport though but they allow privates to tr transport and that's but the, the private institution private does in charge. It, and then they bill privately through whatever means it's not done through the county right so that 982 is including the paramedic response and a private ambulance transport yes okay if they're at 982 um, and they have a private vendor that they contract with the transport why is our fee higher they also will charge for specific uh, items and what we do is we include those items as a part of the fee okay and when we talk about full cost recovery the number mentioned 56 million dollars how much of that is recovered we would the, bring in the entire 56.3 is all recovered you recover well how are we recovering build. Build it's build I'm asking how much build. is recovered in other words 56 million is due how much is received 56.3 million is received we bill over 56.3 okay what do we bill then that's the question we bill approximately 100 million 100 million so half of it's not getting collected now in the county how much of it's not being collected with their process with they, their private ambulance transport I do not have access to that I'd like to find that out on the report back but mr. Reyes has a very valid point people that can't afford it a thousand dollars a lot of money to go to the hospital uh, and we need to provide that service at the same time we need to make sure that our program is somewhat similar to the county and if there's a half half of it's not recovered how to recover that do we lower the fee so we can recover more uh, I can understand the balance clearly we've got to recover something but a hundred million dollars should be recovered we're recovering 56 what's the county's recovery rate and what are they doing to get that recovery rate so we can balance the books obviously we've got to pay for the service it's a lot of money a thousand dollars a trip to the hospital the other question I have and I've spoken to a number of paramedics about this when they get to the hospital and that hospital emergency room has a five or six hour waiting period they're babysitting that patient for five or six hours the county doesn't do that because the private ambulance transports the paramedics go back to service have we ever evaluated that how those paramedics can get back in service and not stay with that patient which somebody has to stay with them but sometimes it's up to eight hours where they're staying with the patient because the hospital is overcrowded what, well, how do we balance that out well our EMS unit is working with the hospitals and they're working on those types of issues on a regular basis what have you heard is the longest wait for a patient to receive treatment where the paramedics are, the paramedic unit standing by with them at the hospital I personally have not heard I'd like to get that report back too because there's a lot of paramedic service that could be used that is sitting idle because the hospital is not accepting that patient and the paramedics are standing by with them on the gurney uh, and that's been rated to me by a number of paramedics they get very frustrated with it because the hospital can't accept the person they can't leave the person so they're sitting there waiting for that person meanwhile other calls for service then other units have to be dispatched from adjoining stations and paramedic service is critical and there's no question we need to maintain that but we need to maintain that service out there for the accident victims the heart attack victims the other victims when that unit's out of service for an extended period of time 
that's a problem. The county doesn't encounter that because they're not going to the hospital. So I'm not saying we need to contract out for paramedic transport. I'm just saying we need to do it so it's fair for everyone. So the people that need that service can get that service and not, well, there's no ambulance available. Mr. In, in terms of the report back, could we see what the trends were for the past year? Can we look at where these uh, calls were made and, and what was the frequency of calls and analyze the geographic areas that uh, they fall in? So that we have a, a sense of, of, of the behavior of this system and how we're responding and maybe think uh, out some other strategies that deals with cost recovery, uh, perhaps uh, focus on how we appeal to the public and how we send messages based on the the socioeconomic uh, characteristics of different areas, so we can be a little bit sharper in our message and, and what we're doing or not doing, and maybe help us in cost recovery. But if we knew and understood the pattern of activity in the city, it might give us a, a greater sense of of how to approach this uh, and how to create a, a solution. Yes. In fact, we're looking at that uh, and have been collecting data, Councilman, on those very topics that you mentioned. Great. Okay. Thank you. So that'll be part of the report back. Mr. Smith. Yeah, yeah just two questions. One, um, I, I agree with Mr. everything Mr. Zine said, because I've talked to paramedics too, and they say we just sit there and twiddle our thumbs for hours in hospitals. What a waste. Um, and a lot of it's because there's not enough hospitals. We've lost too many hospitals. That's understandable but we've got to find a way for them to accept those patients and get those people back on the street or have a, a babysitting service we put somebody in that sits with those people and let the RA go back to the field something like that but uh, we need to find a solution to that uh, one question that I find conflicting here is you, you say first of all that this is a co full cost recovery and then you say it's in a county alignment we're trying to align with the county which is it what we do is the full co we take the total cost of the uh, EMS program yeah. by the by the number of transports, and then we have to split it up between ALS and BLS. Mm -hmm. And at that point, we start aligning ourselves with the County of Los Angeles to see their rate difference. Well, you can't have it both ways. You're either doing it for full cost recovery, which is the rule of this state of California for one under Prop 13 and this city, or you're doing it to just to mimic what the county's doing. And I would suggest the county's not a good primer because they do a lot of it as private collect as well. Um, and I think their recovery rates are a lot higher because of private enterpri enterprise orders. They're going to go after those people a lot better than we do because if they don't collect the money, they go broke. If we don't collect the money, we get a headline in the Daily News. So By Rick Orloff. By Rick Orloff. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I think we need to say this is not to be a county alignment. Just say that it is similar to the county because I think that opens us up to criticism that if you're saying it's for county alignment purposes, that's illegal under Prop 13. We're collecting what it costs us to do it, and it's an, in alignment with what the county's getting, too. But I don't think it's an apples and orange. I think it's a apples and apple, not an apple and apple comparison with the county. So I, I don't think we should say that. Um, and then finally, uh, Chief, um, what is the status on the BLS uh, protocols and review for dispatch? Are we, uh, I've argued for years that we waste a huge amount of money dispatching people, uh, our RAs for uh, stupid little things like people stubbing their toe or getting a cut finger, and then we end up transporting frequently for those things too, which we shouldn't be doing. No other city does that. So I understand there's been a review going on. Where yeah. are we in that process? We're currently under review. We have an EMS work group that is looking at that to determine uh, if we need to modify our current dispatch. Uh, part of the issue is trying to determine a, a method of trying to capture all that information. Uh, part of the problem that we run into is that you will have dispatches that start out as an ALS or a paramedic transport that ends up uh, being downgraded, downgraded to a BLS, yeah. trying to capture that yeah. information, what questions are being asked that trigger an ALS response that ultimately end into a BLS call. Mm -hmm. Trying to figure out a way to capture that information is the difficulty that we're running into. Uh, it deals with a um, uh, process uh, change, a logarithm, uh, software change, and so forth. So as soon as we can figure out a way to capture that, then that will assist us in developing a method to evaluate if we can reduce the number of resources that we dispatch. Well, I think the problem starts with the Clausen protocols, which were written as a knee-jerk reaction to lawsuits when back in the 70s or 80s. Mm -hmm. um, 
And when we wrote those, it was the city attorney's opinion, just dispatch for everything that comes on 9-11. And then we'll deal with it when we get there. And now our department says, well, if we get there and we see a problem, we take them. We just, we just do that. No other city does it that way. And it all goes back to those Clawson protocols, which just says if somebody follow, phones us 911, it's going to be our problem. We should have in the Clawson protocols a better checkoff system saying what is the problem and saying, oh, that's something you need to go see your doctor about. Because I've had paramedics tell me they get to the house and people have their bags packed already <laughs> to go to the hospital, uh, and they're using us as a transport service. And then frequently they don't pay the bill. And I, th I think it's well documented. We're not collecting what we should be. So we really need to see that whole issue resolved because I would predict, having talked to a lot of paramedics in this city, that close to half of our BS, uh, BLS calls are something without the L in the middle. They're just BS. Um, and I Bold of the day. Bold of the day. Good line. Bold of the day. Of the day. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> just, uh, you you, you, you finished you. it. You just yeah. you say thank you. Right. Thank you. you I just you. did. <laughs> Good. Well done. <laughs> All right, we're going to have to... I've got, Mr. Chair, I've got, I've got one more. i got Mr. one more. Houston can report comeback. <laughs> oh, we're going to try and get it out in 30 days? 30 days? Okay, because we asked for report backs, and it, we don't hear from it for three months or four months, so we're talking about four weeks then. Okay, thank you. One more question on cost recovery. Uh, DUITC, a drunk driving crash, injuries, paramedics, fire department, extrication, et cetera, transportation, all that. We try to get recovery on that. What about the, the firefighters that are there extricating the individuals? Do we bill for that as far as cost recovery? No. No. Because I know that the that police department, the law says the police department can do that um, when an incident takes place, such as a drunk driver who gets involved in a situation. We can get cost recovery from that. We may want to look into that because the law permits that to be done. So if someone has a collision and they're drunk and there's a crime involved, not just a straight traffic collision, but some other extenuating circumstances, maybe there's some dollars that we can collect from the insurance company on a cost recovery. And that law was passed a number of years ago because of the tragedy with drunk driving. And if we can increase that $56 million to $100 million, that's obviously more money to uh, operate the city of Los Angeles. So if we can get that as part of it on cost recovery for other services provided by the fire department. Thank you. All right, thank you. Appreciate the presentation and uh, look forward to the report back. We'll get it scheduled soon, Mr. Reyes. Mm -hmm. um, oh, and we'll, good point. And we'll approve but there's a lot of money. Yeah. the uh, report that's before us today. Thank you. Thank you. Final, final item. Fire. Item 5, Board of Fire Commissioners report relative to an extension of the 2007 FEMA Urban Search and Rescue Task Force Readiness Cooperative Agreement Grant, reprogramming of grant funds and related actions. Good morning. What we're here for is uh, specifically to ask for extensions uh, of our 06 FEMA grant and our 07 FEMA grant. Um, our 06 FEMA grant, we're looking at about 25000 This was, uh, um, we're asking for this because we were unable to spend that. We realized some uh, savings due to uh, uh, equipment purchases towards the end of the grant. We weren't, be able to, weren't able to spend that in the, in the last fiscal year. So we're asking for an extension of this uh, grant so we could spend that additional $25,000. Um, the 07 grant, um, we're asking for uh, $456,000 and $220,000 loaned into our um, equipment purchase account so that we can uh, purchase additional equipment to support the FEMA program. Any questions, colleagues? That's all uh, FEMA and other funds? Yes, sir. Nothing local? <laughs> Nothing local. Okay. That's fine. Well, when we just, we've recently dispatched some folks to uh, Texas and Louisiana, I think. Louisiana, correct, sir. Is that fully reimbursable through this grant? or for no, no, sir. Um, these are preparedness grants. This is just to for training and equipment to okay. prepare the team. Yeah. Once we send the teams out there, yeah. uh, FEMA, underneath the presidential declaration, uh, we will so ask we for FEMA. complete reimbursement right. separate from this. Thank you. You know, there was a component talking about the, the response to other locations and emergencies. There was a question when they went to New Orleans after Katrina about security for the fire personnel. 
some security be provided for them. Was that ever resolved where they would have National Guard or local police or someone basically protecting them from the, the violent situations? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The NRCC, FEMA, working through the NRC um, through ESF 13 has been providing force protection forces for our people. Currently, our teams that are back in, in Houston are running with uh, Border Patrol agents okay. as force protection. So this is their first exercise since, uh, since Katrina and for, since those concerns were raised, um, and it appears to be working well. We do have good force protection with us on this mission. So they now have part of it, the part of the plan is they will have a law enforcement component to protect Correct. the firefighters and they're doing their duties. Correct. Great. Correct. Okay. As of now, as I say, uh, we have Border Patrol agents with our team back in Great. Houston. Great. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you for that presentation. And without any further questions, we'll approve the request and send it. Thank you very much for that. Mr. White, that's the last item. It is. No hands, no cards. That's it. Thank you, everybody. You can, John, join me on the We've already turned, but uh, I could say over. I'd like to go on record as uh, supporting the items that were approved prior to my arrival. Okay. Um, no problem. Okay. No, no, it's too late. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to go back to my.